Greetings, friends. Yeah. Welcome back to a new episode of Dreamscapes. I already screwed that up. I never say new episode. I usually say another episode of Dreamscapes, but we're going with it this time. No second takes. Um, today we have our friend, author Jim Marshall, and uh, we're going to tell you more about him in just a moment. Please stop what you're doing. Like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Always need more volunteer dreamers. Please buy one of my now 13 books of historical dream literature available on Amazon. Links in the description. That's the housekeeping. Back to our guest. Uh, Jim, I understand uh, you're, you're coming out of Arizona there. It's always nice to find out where, where people are. Um, and you are currently an author, but you were in the past a human development engineer, and that brought you around to writing your book, Septemics, Hierarchies of Human Potential. That's S-E-P-T-E-M-I-C-S, Septemics. I have no idea what that is, uh, and I'd love to hear about it. What's, what's the deal with that? Okay. Well, first of all, it's just hierarchies of human phenomena. Phenomena. Sorry, I wrote the wrong word. Yeah. Oh, because they both start with a P. That's what got me. Well, I'll make sure it's right in the description below. Um, so what, yeah, how did that come about? And what is a, what is a human development engineer? Okay, well, well, first of all, I am the discoverer of hitherto unknown phenomena, which greatly aid in the understanding of people. I'm the inventor of a revolutionary practical philosophic system called Septemics and the author of the book you just referenced. Uh, if you'd like to find out about Septemics, go to septemics.com, S-E-P-T-E-M-I-C-S. And link in the description. As my qualifications, I am a polymathic intellectual whose areas of expertise include psychology, philosophy, theology, parapsychology, science, engineering, mathematics, law, literature, history, metaphysics, military science, political science, physical culture, education, organization, and music. And I hold a Bachelor of Science cum laude from City University of New York. Nice. That is truly a polymath. I'm with you, or I was, all the way up until the uh, mathematical stuff. I am not a mathematician, just a wizard of words. So that's nice. And that gives you, that gives a very broad overview of the human condition and i wouldn't be surprised if you've come up with some insights from that so what is how do you describe septemics to people what maybe even what does that term mean to you okay septemics is a philosophical science based on the fact that many phenomena related to human beings occur in a sequence of seven levels hmm. literally the word septemics means over pertaining to seven septemics comprises a collection of scales or sequences each of which breaks down various human phenomena into a hierarchy of seven steps. There are 35 set scales which span the spectrum of human experience, by which I mean there is no situation that's going to arise in the life of a human to which one or more of these scales does not apply. Hmm. There are 24 scales which apply primarily to individuals and 11 which apply primarily to groups. Very cool. So what would be an example of one scale that has seven steps? Maybe we can kind of describe that to people. Do you have one off the top of your head? Uh, well, yeah, well, the, the first scale uh, I discovered, and the first one in the book is what I call the scale of basic purposes. And the discovery of that scale led me to the discovery of the subject through several stages. Hmm. So uh, what, how did you describe that again? I, I think I didn't catch one of the words. It was a scale of... The scale of basic purposes purposes basic purposes yes. okay so these are the reasons one might have for taking an action or believing something is that kind of how it works uh per no purpose? no it's every human being has one basic purpose hmm. in most cases that persists for the person's entire life gotcha uh now of course everyone has thousands of purposes but there's one basic purpose and when you know either your own basic purpose or another's basic purpose you understand that person very well without anything further because you know what he's basically trying to do. For okay. example, I know the basic purpose of every president of the United States as far back as FDR. Because since FDR, there's been a lot of uh, broadcast, radio, film, TV, so it's easy to study those people. And once you know these skills, it's not hard at all to use them to uh, analyze a person, see where the person is. So, cool. no, I do know the basic purpose of some presidents who are older than FDR, such as Lincoln, Jefferson, and Washington. But those are people I actually studied. Yeah. Uh, but some of the others, 
you know, if I wanted to know, for example, the basic purpose of Miller Fillmore, I would have to study Miller Fillmore, uh, which is, I could think of better things to do than that. Sure. <laughs> but, but all of these scales, all of these scales are easily applicable once you know them. So if we were to give people a kind of a basic description of, of the seven phases or steps of, 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 uh, of the basic purpose type scale, how does, how does that look like? What's like one, two, three, four? Is that too complicated to describe in a verbal well, format? Or? It's, not, it's not complicated. I can describe it. Fair enough. Uh, but I, I don't want to make this about one scale because each of the 35 scales is unique. Gotcha. They, they are all based on natural law. Uh, meaning they all have a mathematical component to them. Okay. Although in studying the book, it doesn't feel like you're studying math, although it is referenced in isolated spots. But mm. for me, as an engineer with a hard science background, that's what led me to realize, A, that I was into something big, B, that this was natural law, and C, eventually I realized this is a separate subject which is actually the biggest problem in proliferating this information because, first of all, most people don't read books. Of the ones who do read books, most of them read fiction books. Mm -hmm. Of the ones who read nonfiction books, most of them are in a particular slot, meaning psychologists read psychology books, mathematicians read mathematics books, historians read history books, and so forth. Okay? This book does not fit into any pre-existing slot. All of the pre-existing slots fit into this book. Gotcha. So you're looking at kind of an overarching, you know, all-encompassing system, uh, systematic approach to understanding. Yes. Uh, gotcha. Yes. Very interesting. That I mean, so, I would say that is very much up the alley of you know where psychology and philosophy blend together. The yes. human behavior and the why of of things in yes. general. Very cool. Yes. I mean, that's right up my alley. I love that stuff. I'm very much the uh, philosophy, metaphysics, uh, psychology guy. Um, that's kind of, kind of how I define, it's not necessarily how I define a wizard, but it's something that, uh, one type of wizard would do is get into those specialties and become expert in those areas to, to the degree right. they can and have something worthy, worthwhile, useful, beneficial to share. Um, kind of the, the, in my estimation and this, I tell folks uh, occasionally, but, uh, what, it, you know, a wizard is a very powerful archetype in human history. It's basically the wise elder that speaks magic words, communicates information, tells people things they need to know, and also has the, um, understanding of cause and effect from a long life to say, I can tell you that's a mistake because I know what comes next. You don't want to do that. That's part of the speaking magic words, but they can see the future in that way. So it very much the idea of a wizard. I'm not, I'm not summoning demons and, and throwing fireballs. I'm trying to speak magic words and, and help people see inside themselves where they wouldn't be able to see without this kind of a living mirror, so to speak. So uh, that's my rant. That, that's, <laughs> that's exactly what Septemics does. Yeah. You describe it perfectly. It, it enables you to analyze yourself and others in a variety of contexts in a way that's empowering to the individual. Very cool. See, I wrote this book. I wrote this book to help people. I worked with hundreds of clients for decades as human development engineer. Yeah, what is that? And Maybe. I have gone. I have gone from helping people by the hundreds now to helping people by the millions, because this book will help. Anyone who can read English who wants to improve himself or his life. I already know that. That is not a question because I worked on this book for 25 years before I published it. Nice. Because as an engineer, my mandate is to produce something that works, mm -hmm. actually works all the time. And so I got all the bugs out of this. Uh, the, the, the first transcript was finished in late 95. And I passed it around to scholarly colleagues of mine, and they were blown away by it. So I realized that I had something here. Uh, so then I started giving it to clients and friends and such. And every person who has ever read this book or discussed it with me has had a very positive response to it. Very cool. I mean, I'm very interested in it, definitely. And I'm, I'm hoping folks out there find it interesting just to hear that this exists um, that, that someone is, cause it, you know, so I'm doing the historical dream literature thing. I'm going back to all these, so we say great thinkers and specifically in, in my context, these are all the publications that were released around 
Freud's interpretation of dreams, which kind of broke the door wide open. And hundreds of years, even thousands of years before that, everything Freud would have known to coagulate his view into something he could express. And then we can critique it afterwards, you know, but all of this stuff, it's these great thinkers. And I've never heard of half of these people, but they were the founding fathers of say dream psychology that led me to my understanding today. And I'm getting even better understanding going back through their work. So to relate it to you, sorry. Um, you know, it's possible that if you weren't here with me telling folks about what you do, it would get lost in history. It'd be one of those things where someone like me a hundred years from now would have to rediscover it. Uh, if we can't, you know, at least get it out there and let, let folks see what they can make of it. Uh, to that end, I was going to ask you if you've managed to get it to any people yet that are implementing it in any way, you know, whether academically yeah. or, or in business, business uh, settings or. Well, the reason I'm doing interviews and I've done many is mm -hmm. to get people to find out about, about this because I told you about the problem. It's hard to get people to look at a new subject it's true. because most people are in a box. Okay. And whatever box those people are in, all of those boxes fit in this subject. So this book is universally applicable. Uh, each of these 35 skills provides the user with an infallible way of determining the salutariness or beneficialness of any group, individual, or activity. If the group, individual, or activity moves the person or group up these scales, it's beneficial or positive. If it moves them down, it's detrimental or negative. More importantly, just finding out what level you or another person or some group is at is by itself enlightening and beneficial. And finally, once you know the actual level of a person or group, you can improve that person or group by moving them up one level at a time. Mm -hmm. All of these advantages represent major steps forward for society. Each of these 35 skills is an axis against which to evaluate human behavior. And combined, they empower one to understand, predict, and manage human affairs to a degree hitherto unattainable by most. Okay. Very cool. That's I, very uh, synchronistic, I would say, t today to have you bring this conversation about something I know nothing about, but it has connections with, because I've been arguing with folks on Twitter, I like philosophical debates. I like seeking the truth. Uh, so it's not about butting heads for fun necessarily, although I do enjoy it. Long story short, we're, we're, we've been going back and forth on different systems of moral assessment, how to determine what is good and what is right to do in any given situation, having superordinate goals or, or foundational principles that are consistently applied, uh, that kind of stuff. So I don't know if yours leads into uh, uh, moral systems more, or it is purely in the realm of functional behavior type stuff. How would you kind of break that down? Is it a little bit of both? Well, or? well first of all, it depends on the scale. But you want me to read you the names of the scales so you'll know what we're talking about? We could, I suppose. Um, it, it might be interesting to hear a few of them, yeah. Okay. These are the individual scales. Mm -hmm. The scale of basic purposes. The scale of personal influence. The scale of choice. The scale of permeation. The scale of thought. The scale of identity. The scale of evaluation. The scale of motivation. The scale of control. The scale of stopping. The scale of scholarship. The scale of literacy. The scale of human ability. The scale of memory the scale of spiritual identity, the scale of mental deletion, the scale of aberration, the scale of physical fitness, the scale of justification, the scale of belief, the scale of equanimity, the scale of attack, the scale of conflict, and the scale of reaction. Those are the individual scales. Nice. And then there are 11 group scales. And then they can also blend and maybe two scales function on the same subject or axis, so to speak. Is, is that kind of how it works? Well, let me put it this way. Most of the time, if a person has a situation or a dilemma that he's trying to resolve, he will find more than one scale is useful to him in resolving it. Gotcha. That's sometimes, what I was going for. Yeah. Sometimes there is only one scale, but you really only need one scale because these scales are unbelievably powerful. I mean, mm -hmm. any one of these scales released by itself could completely change the person's life. Uh, if you go through this book, and find your level on each of these 35 scales, you will be a different person at the end of the book. Very cool. 
It's that transformation. Is, that is a powerful tool. Yeah, just giving people the opportunity to self-reflect in that way in and of itself is right. fantastic. And then to give them kind of maybe more concrete ideas. A lot of a lot of our difficulty, I think, in human communication is being, well, what I'm doing, I'm fumbling for my words, trying to speak clearly, describe things in a way that makes sense and also in a way that is comprehensive enough to to not not leave things out it looks like you got enough scales to cover i would have i would be hard pressed off the top of my head to say you left anything out um i i'm not saying you did or didn't but i'm saying i that feels pretty damn comprehensive to me uh so <laughs> um that yeah, would be yeah and I, and I didn't read the group scales i mean right read yeah the group scale, either, they resolve immense things the gotcha. scale of relationships there's a scale of relationships. Yeah. How valuable is that? Who doesn't have trouble with relationships? Yeah, definitely. Well, I think, I mean, at the very least, I'm going to be looking into this myself and 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 probably pick up a copy of the book just because I, I do find it fascinating. And it right is, it is in my box. You found a guy who actually, this is kind of the box I'm looking at too, these uh, philosophical, metaphysical, practical application type of tools. I, I love that stuff. So you came to the right place for talking about it. Someone who's at least enthusiastic about the subject. <laughs> so, and I find, you know, I'm doing many interviews with people all over the world. Every person who I talk to has a response very similar to yours. Very cool. The, the, and that is how this book works. If you look at the scale, each scale is laid out in a, what you might call a table or a matrix or a, or a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the scale, all of the fallout from it, all the implications, all the underpinnings are right there in the same way that the periodic table is like that. You know, when you look at the periodic table, you see the whole, all the elements in relationship to one another in the correct way. Every one of these tables and the corresponding scale is like the periodic table. That is very cool. And that, and I have a tremendous respect for that um, purpose or drive up in the, in the engineering. So my dad's an engineer and it is that practical application. Does it work? You know, you succeeded when the bridge does not fall down. Yes. That that's it. It has to just work. And if it works, it works. And uh, I, I love that phrase too. If it looks stupid, but it works, it's not stupid. <laughs> it might be ugly, but it's not stupid. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, Exactly. Well, very cool. Well, did you want to say more about your um, uh, history as a human development engineer? Or did you want to move on to the the dream thing, uh, or do you have more to say about the book? Either way, I'm I'm easy. Well, well, let me just let me just say how I went from being a human development engineer to being the creator of Septemex. Yeah, it's a very interesting story. So Go ahead. By the time I graduated college, uh, I'm talking about my bachelor's degree. I knew several things that most people don't know. One is. I knew that although I was an engineer, I didn't want to engineer airfoils and electrons and gears and motors. I wanted to electron. I wanted to engineer the human psyche. Mm. So then, instead of going for a graduate degree, which is what, which I always expected to do, I went and studied all the alternative subjects that I could find. Today we call them alternatives, because. Another thing that I knew by the time I graduated was everything that the mainstream had to offer. Without being an expert in any of those things, I knew what was there. Mm. And there were huge chasms of data missing. Now, even as a child, I wanted to know about the twilight zone, the outer limits, mm -hmm. uh, one step beyond, you know, the unknown. What are, what are these unknowns? And I was searching as a child. Now, eventually, after many decades, that turned out to be Septemex. So in some, some subconscious way, I was on the road to Septemex, even as a small child. So another thing that I knew by the time I graduated is, uh, with my bachelor's degree was I really knew how to learn. Now, you could say I knew how to study because that's how you learn. Mm -hmm. But either way, I knew that I had that really down, better than most people ever do. There is a scale of scholarship, by the way. Right. Uh, yeah. which I mentioned. <laughs> so I had moved myself quite a bit up that scale before I knew there was a scale. But so I then studied all these alternative subjects. And I should tell you that my motto, which came late in life, is learn everything, believe nothing. Oh, yeah. I'm right with you on that. Because, because 
a, ba a, a belief is always a barrier to learning. Mm. Because once you believe it, you're, it, it doesn't change. To some degree, That's you're it. Blocked. Yeah, you're right. So you have to be. You have to. For example, uh, see, I will not. Mostly, if people ask me if I believe, I generally say I neither believe nor disbelieve, mm -hmm. because it doesn't serve me to say it doesn't help my my goal, which is to learn everything. And that led me eventually to this vast subject, which I became enthused about giving to the human race. I want the people of Earth to have this material so that they can help themselves. Because if you expect the government or a corporation or your brother-in-law to help you, you are going to be very disappointed. Mm -hmm. You have to help yourself. And that's what this book is about. If you get this book, everything is in there that you need, assuming you can read English. You don't need anything else. Fair enough. And, and possible spent, translations pending someday. <laughs> uh, that, that just makes me cringe. Because <laughs> I spent 25 years making sure I was expressing this in, in the best possible way. Because, you know, the phenomenon is not the same as the way you express it. I mean, the phenomena True. exist. I stumbled across them, you might say, yeah. uh, and then I had to express them in a way that most people would relate to, gotcha. uh, which took many years. In an 87,000 word book, I went word by word saying, is this the best way to say this that, so that somebody will connect with it? I know that and editorial also, process very well, yes. <laughs> also, there I put in not only a glossary for every chapter, but there's also a glossary for the introduction, which is actually the longest section of the book, Very to cool. help people with the semantic barrier. Because I want people to be able to use this information. So that is potentially so, a stumbling block, the idea of translating into other language. The idea of lost in translation is very real. Some, some absolutely. things don't phrase the same. There's different concepts involved. Very, very true. Fair enough. Yes. So... I was working as human development engineer, helping people very successfully. And I started observing that they improved in predictable ways. Now, when I say predictable, predictable to me, I never told this to anyone, but I started making notes. And I found after a while that my clients were moving up scales. In other words, I would know we would take up a subject and I would know what the result was going to be for the client before he knew it, before he got to it, because I knew the scale. And if you're at a certain level, you're going to move up to the next level up. Mm. And that is what I was doing for my clients over and over and over. So I started writing these down. Now, I had one scale in particular that had six levels that I knew absolutely was correct. I knew these scales in the order they existed were correct. However, in 1995, I discovered a seventh level of that scale. When I inserted this seventh level into the scale of six, it manifested mathematically, mm. which is to say it presented itself as natural law. Now, then I thought, whoa, this is big. I wonder how many of these other scales are actually seven level scales. Because of the 32 or so scales that I had, only two of them had seven levels. So I said, well, let me look at these and see Maybe they're actually seven level scales. And because I knew what I was looking for, I was able to find the remaining levels on all the other scales fairly easily. Now, in each case, when I found it as a seven level scale, it manifested mathematically. In other words, it presented itself as something that was inarguable in the same way that two sides of an isosceles triangle are equal. Mm. It's almost a tautology to say that. Or, for example, Newton's three laws of motion. Now, of course, his uh, writing those three laws of motion down was a giant step forward for mankind. Mm -hmm. uh, every physics student in the world knows them and accepts them as inarguable. Yeah, uh, we can see them so, in action mankind, and they don't change. Yeah. Mankind did not get them until Newton. It took Newton to notice this and to write it down. And that's, you know, there's a thing. And that's a crazy thing, too, the idea that this knowledge was there. It was always there. We couldn't that's see it. 
And that is insane. that's what I consider like a lot of human progress is not so much inventing new things as discovering what already exists. Right. The potential is eternal. Once it's, right. once it's identified, we go, well, what's always there? We just never saw it before. Uh, right. Yeah. It's just like the theory of relativity. Okay. Mm-hmm. The phenomena of relativity are intrinsic to the universe. They were always there and they will always be there. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it just took Einstein in 1905 to put it together and express it. Now, all of us in the physics community accept it as there's no getting around it. It's been proven experimentally, okay? Same thing with the heliocentric theory. Now, so yeah. far as I know, the first person who propounded the heliocentric theory was a Greek in 300 BC. I think it was Zeno. Way remember. ahead of his time. <laughs> And that did not catch on for 1,800 years yeah. until Copernicus presented it. Now, of course, the Earth was revolving around the sun before there were people. And the whole time. And still be revolving yeah. around the sun after we were extinct. Uh, so it's inherent. It's, it's inarguable. Uh, you know, there are people who, I was astonished to find this, who actually believe the Earth is flat. Those people obviously did not study physical science, because mm-hmm. if you study physical science, not only not only is it provably true that the heliocentric theory is correct, but the idea of the Earth being flat, it's impossible. Yeah. It defies all the basic laws of physics. So this material that I came across was there all along. Now, you can ignore it. Uh, but you, when you ignore it, you are hampering yourself because not only will this book help you to achieve your goals faster and easier, it will save you from an enormous amount of heartache and catastrophe. For example, if the people of Germany had this book before 1933, Hitler never would have come to power mm. because... He's discussed in this book in many contexts as a person who's at the bottom of many scales. Mm. They would have read this and they would have looked at him and said, this guy's basic purpose is to destroy, which is factually true. And if you study him or Pol Pot, another example, these purple people were inherently destructive. Now, there are many criminals who are destructive, but they're not inherently destructive. Like Al Capone was not inherently destructive. If you got in his way, he would kill you. That's just because you got in his way. Yeah. Hitler was inherently destructive. He he ruined everything. He ruined the Wehrmacht. He ruined Germany. He ruined Europe. Okay, Europe mm-hmm. was never really the same after that. So we're talking about a very very dangerous person, and uh, I'm telling you, once you know these skills, it's not hard to figure out where people, yourself or others, fit on these skills. Good. It's it's almost obvious once you know the material. So Hitler would have gotten some votes. Uh, he would have gotten votes from psychopaths, sociopaths, criminals, uh, crazy people, corrupt people. But that's not enough to get 37%, mm-hmm. which is what the Nazis got that gave them a plurality and brought them to power. Yeah. So that's an example of a catastrophe that could have been prevented by people having this book. Right, so that's uh, that's I on a grand there, scale too. But then you got the more personal levels, like just your life. Like, where am I at, and where right. what what is the potential for improvement, right. and what are the steps maybe I could take to move towards that next level? That, that's a useful thing. Even if, let's say if we uh, if we were to say this is all complete, and I'm not saying it is, but if we were to say it's all complete, spooky woo, philosophical. Uh, what am I trying to say? The idea of uh, p- parapsychology. If we were to say it was nothing more than that and it worked, it would still be useful in my estimation. Right. Like whatever your system is, if it's not hurting you, it's only helping you uh, go for it. In, in my opinion, right. you know, that kind of thing, whatever, whatever you got to believe to get you through the day in, in a lot of ways that isn't hurting you or other people caveat, but right. um, that's yeah. And part of the reason I worked on it for 25 years is to get feedback. So the reaction that everybody has to this book, is something like, wow, yeah, wow, and, and yeah. Very cool. You know? So well, I'd love when to see I was it. a young person, I didn't have this material, and I made terrible mistakes, just like everybody else, being with people I shouldn't have been around. 
okay? Mm. I was smart enough to, you know, not let it wreck my life. But still, obviously, there are regrets because of things that I did that most people do these things all the time for their whole lives. Man. This book can foreshorten that process. In other words, it can warn you. Uh, I bump into people now uh, and I can see they're at certain levels on certain scales and I know I'm just going to stay away from this person. Have a nice day. Goodbye. Yeah. You know, a lot of people get that feeling intuitively and they struggle to justify it rationally. And sometimes they override it because they can't justify it rationally and they leave, right. leave themselves in harm's way by trying not to be a bad person or judge people. But sometimes you got to go with your gut on those type of things. And it might I be, agree. it might be a useful tool to say, my gut says X, let's check the chart. Ah, yeah, that's why I feel this way. And now it makes Now I have the rational understanding of where I'm coming from on that. Why I had that intuitive understanding that, that I just couldn't express before. So that seems yeah, incredibly useful. So this is human phenomena through the eyes of an engineer. Very you, cool. If you use this book, you don't need intuition. All you need to do is study the material, understand it. And I went through a lot of trouble to make it comprehensible and then apply it. It's very simple. The book is filled with detailed explanation of how to use it, how to apply it to yourself, how to apply it to others. It's very specific because I wanted this to be a comprehensive handbook that every person on earth would want to have. Very and cool. that's what I get when I, when I, when people read this, you know, if you read the reviews, for example, it's like, wow. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. Now and that's, I understand why why I couldn't get along with my ex wife. And that's got to be very satisfying like to you as the as the creator of like to to have this thing that you put your heart and soul into decades into and and really tried to make it the best possible benefit it could be and to have people say this this works I appreciate your your efforts there's there's a few things better that's why I love doing the the dream thing here it's like we spend an hour or two talking to somebody we get to the end of it and they say wow, I learned something I didn't know. I see myself in a new way. That mystery is kind of solved and I get to feel good about that. You know, I, I, I get to feel good because I genuinely did some good and someone appreciates it. That There's a few things that are more satisfying in life, I think. Right. So, you know, when I was working as a human development engineer, that of course was very satisfying work. Every person who came to me, I helped. And the longer they stayed with me, the more I helped them. Some people I work with for hundreds and hundreds of hours I completely improve their life, dramatically change their personalities. Okay, uh, so of course that was very fulfilling. So I sort of had that going on. Then when I discovered this phenomenon and I realized this is natural law, I then I said, okay, I can help not people by the hundreds, but people by the millions, yeah. which is why I'm doing interviews now to get this book out and to have people have a way without spending a lot of money, without getting into a belief system to learn something that actually helps them on a day-to-day -day basis in a reliable way. Because what I get from a lot of people is something like, this has the ring of truth. Mm. Or yes, this, is, this really makes sense to me. Things like that. Because it's natural law. It's yeah. like, no matter how long you talk to me, you can never talk me out of the Pythagorean theorem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? I took 26 semesters of math. I loved every minute of it. And I use that theorem all the time in all kinds of ways. Okay? Yeah. It's built into the fabric of the universe. There's no getting around it. And that's why uh, I spent 25 years on perfecting this so that I could give it to the average person. Now, of course, professional criminals, psychopaths, sociopaths, narcissists, they're not going to use this book. You hope not, because right? They're, <laughs> because they're not into wanting to improve themselves. Because in order to improve, improve yourself, it takes a certain amount of humility to say, I need help. I'm not as good as I can be. Yeah, on this. that's a big one. Not as good as you could be. 
Uh, right. A lot of people, we spend a lot of time telling people you're fine the way you are. And there's something to that. Don't beat yourself up too much, but there's always room for improvement as well. It's one of those things where it's like, could I be better than I am right now? Yeah. I mean, should I be? Probably. Uh, should I at least keep my eyes open for opportunities? Yeah, it's not a bad idea. Not going to hurt. Right. You know. <laughs> and one of the problems solved by this is people like us, okay, we will have situations arise. We will see that it's a situation and want to do something about it, but may not know what to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. This book solves that problem because one of the axioms of this subject is that you can never skip a level. Never. It's impossible. Mm. It's just like if you're on the first floor and you want to go to the fifth floor, one way or another, you have to go through the second, the third, and the fourth. In Even order, if you yeah, use a physically. rope ladder outside the building. Okay? Yep. It doesn't matter if you take an escalator, an elevator, or the stairs. You're still going through second, third, and fourth to get to the fifth. And that is how these scales are. You can never skip a level. That's valuable information because this uh, solves the gradient problem. For example, mm. it's widely known by most of us now that crash diets and crash exercise programs do not work. Mm. And the reason they don't work is it's not on a gradient. Yeah. So all good counselors, good teachers uh, understand this. Like you take a guy who knows how to teach algebra. He knows the gradient, okay? He knows how to put in the gradient, not only in general, but for specific students so that they all get it, okay? Mm. A lousy teacher doesn't do that. And that's why he's a lousy teacher. Yeah. <laughs> so so this, this is, gives you the gradients because when you find the level, assuming you found it correctly, you can get to the next level up. It tells you where you're going to go if you improve. It tells you what the next state is. It's specific. So it tells you where you're going to get to. And if you put your, some effort into improving that one level, you will get there. Very cool. And that's so, that, those are a lot of very powerful messages, too. We, we have metaphors from a million different sources that say, you know, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You got to commit to a path and you got to put one foot in front of the other and you don't get to the end of the road without all those steps and you can't right. skip steps really uh, you got to travel physically one way or another to the destination uh very very and when you talk about natural law too these things have to make sense uh, things right. can't be count some things can be counterintuitive because we can't always trust our institu intuition but very often things do make sense for a reason because that's how it works and right. once you see it yeah for sure. Well, well, I want to say one more thing. Sure. If your viewers ignore everything else I say, get this one thing. I know, K-N-O-W, that these scales are correct. I spent 25 years verifying them. And realize, before I started writing the book, I was getting these bits and pieces for decades. Okay? So, and watching them work in the sessions that I did. So... So I already knew that they worked. Uh, what happened when I realized that it was, they were, that I had suddenly 32 seven level scales. I said, whoa, this is big. Especially since when they were seven levels, they manifested mathematically. And then I knew they were inarguable, just like the Pythagorean theorem is inarguable. Now there are people who don't know it and they have my sympathy because it's a wonderful tool, you know? If you want to figure out how long the pathway is going to be to go from one end of your garden to the other, you can use a Pythagorean theorem to figure it out mm -hmm. in two minutes. And it okay? works every so, time. Right. That's right. And so, so coming from a hard science background and then working in a sort of alternative context with people and helping them, oh, th this became clear to me primarily because I'm a polymath because I know so many things well that I was able to see what they were. For example, there's a scale of exchange. You don't hear about that in economics, but this scale completely undercuts the entire subject of economics. Mm. It goes through seven levels of exchange and it tells you easily what levels are 
going to work and what levels aren't. Uh, and you have to realize that a lot of these scales are going to be an eye opener. For example, the lowest level on the scale of exchange is taking. You would say, taking? How is that an exchange? Mm. Tell you how it's an exchange. Guy from the mafia comes to you. He says, you're going to give us $100 a week or we're going to blow up your store. Good old protection racket, yep. So you give him the $100 a week, you get to stay in business, you get to stay out of the hospital, you get to stay alive, you get to feed your family. That's the exchange. Yeah. Okay? That is the most prevalent type of exchange there is on earth. Take it. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. So, so that tells you something about the world of exchange. And it goes up from that to, you know, higher levels. Uh, and uh, if you look at what's going on in our society, our society is collapsing, collapsing. If you haven't figured that out, folks, I'm here to tell you. We got some big collapsing. problems. Yeah, we sure it's do. It's collapsing. And, there, and one of the reasons it's collapsing is the exchange is on a completely wrong level. See, if, let's say you're dealing with somebody who's a crook. Are you going to trust that guy to give you a check? Mm. If you are, you're an idiot. <laughs> yep. If you so, know who they are and what they're what they're like, you can you can predict their behavior in that regard. They're going to take what they right. get and so not what I'm give. Is, you yeah. you can exchange with that person. You can deal with those people. You know, uh, in in my business, I've been in a lot of businesses. I dealt with mafia people from time to time because there was a time in New York. I'm from New York where they were as prevalent as the government or the church or anything. Uh, you could not walk down the street without bumping into a mafia guy. You could not walk past a business without there being a mafia person connected with it. Okay. And I dealt with those people fine because I knew who they were, what they were like, what they wanted. I was able to exchange with them. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't exchanging with them because they were in the mafia. They just, I just happened to find out that they were. Yep. Okay. And sometimes it's not so, wise to uh, say, hey, you're connected. We're, I can't work with you anymore because that, that's its own kind of trouble. <laughs> that's yeah. right. That's right. So, so that's just one scale of the 35. So in truth, you can take any one of these scales at random and completely revolutionize your life, completely change for the better how you're living because of the implications. Take something like the scale of thought, okay? There are seven levels of thought, okay? That is news to most people. They are in a sequence. So you can deal with the person and see what level of thought is this guy on, yeah. you see? And so you can see how there's a mismatch. So sure. Or, so or if your, your goal was to, say, communicate with someone, you'd be like, well, maybe I need to pitch my communication to a certain level of understanding. I don't, Like you were describing with, with education, a good educator knows how to do that. You don't go from uh, 1, 2, 3, ABC to calculus. There's a progression. Right. You got to go through right. foundational principles, pieces of the puzzle. You put them in. Now you got a foundation. We can start building the house. Right. Let me show you how to build a house with the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> right. Yeah, very much uh, so. I, start, I started school when I was three. Okay, mm. and I have been active in teaching and learning ever since. Very cool. And this was all in all of my experience as a tutor. I tutored many subjects: I tutored math, science, history, and you name it, music. On all of my experiences, I continually had to work with the students. Say, I understand that, but you have to learn this first, so that you will understand that. And I brought my students along. Now, of course, there are students who are what you might call not good students mm. uh, who will not want that. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I taught music, you know, I get some guitar player who wants to be Eddie Van Halen tomorrow. And I try to explain to him <laughs> that's not going to happen. Okay? Nope. Okay. For most people, that's never going to happen. Okay. He was a freak of nature. But, but, if you want to learn how to, to do this, I will show you the right way to do it. And so I got rave reviews from all the people that I worked with because they all got benefit because I knew 
the sequence, the steps. Yeah. And so I spent 25 years writing this book with that in mind. How is this going to affect the reader? You know, I tried not to use words like words that I would normally use, like quotidian or antediluvian. Mm. Uh, because, not a lot of people know what those mean. Yeah. <laughs> right. if, I, if I can get a word that, you know, like archaic, a lot of people don't know what archaic means. Mm. But, a lot, but most That's one of the simpler what, ones. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, people, a lot of people know what ancient means. Okay. Yep. Or you can just say old. Right. So that's why I spent a lot of time as part of my my mission to create a work that would help anybody who wants to get better, assuming they could read English. Very nice. We got two that's fantastic. Preferred. You got two fantastic things going for you that I think will uh, serve you well in this. One is this tremendous passion that you've put into a lifelong work, and you're uh, full full throated in the passion, and that helps uh, contribute to the second thing was shameless self promotion. Get yourself out there and talk about it, because if you're not going to share what you're passionate about, who's going to do it for you? So you got to right. help yourself in that regard. And I'm happy to give you the chat. That's why you know. We, been talking for at least half an hour or more about this one thing and these introductions to the person and what they do and who they are go on shorter or longer depending but um i want to give i want to give a good chunk of time for people to get an understanding of where you're coming from what you're talking about what you have to offer and how enthusiastic yeah passionate you are about it so i think that sells that sells a lot of books uh and it's a great thing too because it's, it's not about selling books but i appreciate the idea that you are just selling a book you're not doing these seminars necessarily where you're trying to get a bunch of people into a cult and get 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 them on a subscription service or something. You're like, take the book, read the book, learn the things. Absolutely it's all not. it's all in there. Take it, take it. It's for you with my blessings. Uh, at the very least, that's people should feel good about that aspect of of the way you're approaching distributing this information. So, and I I right. appreciate it. I like it. Yeah, you yeah. know, there's a hardbound, <clears throat> a softbound, and an ebook. Ebook is inexpensive mm -hmm. for a very small investment. You can dramatically improve your life. That's a good time to transition. Anyway, uh, you okay. are you have brought your book to share with the world to be of benefit. I am here to be of benefit to you doing the Dream Wizard thing. So we'll transition into that uh, into that phase. And uh, what I do is just shut up and listen, and people tell me the dream beginning to end, and uh, then we see what we can make of it together. So I'm ready to listen and uh, hear what you got. Okay, so this is a dream that I've had multiple times. I guess you call it a recurring dream. Now, each time I have it, it's slightly different, but the substance of it is not different. The substance of it is essentially the same. So the scenario is this. I'm in some kind of an amusement park, and I want to leave. Now... If you've ever been to a place like Disneyland, you know, you say you're in, let's say, Frontierland. You say, okay, I had enough Frontierland. I want to go to Fantasyland. So you leave Frontierland, you went to Fantasyland. So you haven't left the park. You've just gone from one imaginary place to another imaginary place. Okay? But but eventually you can say, well, I've had enough Disneyland. I'm leaving. And you walk out the front gate and you're in the real world again. Right? There's no Mickey Mouse. Okay, so the dream is I'm in this amusement park and I decide, okay, I'm ready to go, I'm, I'm leaving. Okay, and I go through some kind of a door and when I get on the other side, I'm just in another part of the amusement park. So then I'm kind of dismayed to so say, well, okay, I, I didn't realize this door just went to from tomorrow land to fantasy land so i'll just find the right door so i look for again i'm looking for the door another door and i go through that door and i'm still in the amusement park and i keep going through doors and no matter how many doors i go through i'm still in the amusement park so i can't get out of the amusement park I can't get back to the real world. So it's frustrating, it's dismaying. It's sort of like a Twilight Zone episode. You could imagine Rod Serling oh, yeah. doing a good good rendition of this. 
where, you know, there's a point where the guy's practically going crazy because he wants to get out. You know, he doesn't want any more laughing clowns and things like that. He wants to get back to his, his home, you know? Yeah. So I've had this dream many times. Uh, and of course, each time it's upsetting. And it's, it's, I would call it a nightmare. Yeah. And I just can't get out of the amusement park. So, so that sounds like a broad overview of the typical recurring structure. Um, can you think of what, what was the most recent time you had one of these dreams? Was oh, it, I, I don't, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. I, I don't mean, know if it was, it was 10 years uh, ago, five years ago, two weeks ago. Oh, it was more than two weeks ago. Okay. But uh, it's certainly in like maybe a year or two. Okay. But I was well aware that each time I had the dream that it was essentially the same dream, although it wasn't always Disneyland. Sometimes it would be, you know, some other place, similar place where there, I couldn't get out. There are times when it has appeared to be Disneyland uh, or, or, or or that's how, what you would associate with that type of place. Yeah, well, I used to live in California and I went to Disneyland many times. I've been there once, and yeah. Big, <laughs> and I was a big fan of Disneyland. Uh, so that kind of, I mean, now I'm not interested in that sort of thing anymore. But, you know, there was a time when that was, I, I was in awe of Disney and his 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 whole approach to things, you know, this, this whole, this little empire he built, starting with his pen drawing a mouse. Yeah, very much a consummate so, showman. You, you, they are putting on a show everywhere you look, every sight and sound scri- scripted to, to right. create an atmosphere. That's yeah. Right. So I would very go much. and I would be happy and I would, then I would be happy to go home at the end of the day, you know? Yeah, but there's there's enough fun that. sometimes. You gotta, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't go. That was, that is an interesting phenomenon. That's the first thing I look at is 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 this type of thing. It's like amusement parks, places that are generally happy, fun, full of excitement, amusement. It's it's a place of entertainment and and it's like somewhere you want to be, but you're stuck there. You're stuck in a place that should be happy that becomes very unpleasant because you can't get out when you want to. You you don't you've lost control of your ability to choose your own destiny and say, you know, this location, no, not anymore. I'm done. Um, so what usually works best for my process is a discrete instance. And we pick that apart a little bit. And once we do, then we can start looking at how those different elements reoccur in different forms, but they always seem to be kind of the same thing. So you're bringing to me, um, an overview of a process that is repeated multiple times, but you don't have a specific instance of a dream you can remember with some details, with some visual imagery? Um, well, I think in my memory, they were all sort of blended into one another. Yeah. I mean, it does happen. The, yeah. fact, the fact that, I, it, it, because each time I had it, was it was kind of a traumatic experience and I was relieved to finally wake up. Yeah. We don't tend you know? to try to remember our nightmares in detail right. and hang on to them. So it's not, right. not surprising. Um, right. So I was just glad to be the hell out of there. You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, this and this is not the first time that I've had, um, I've been throwing a curveball, and I roll with it, whatever. We're already talking. We're going to do the thing. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make of it what we can. Um, so typical, as I said, my typical process is we get real detailed on one specific dream and that helps me see the picture and the connections form in my head. But I've also gone with another way of looking at things occasionally, which is we try to identify the, the different elements from the broad overview. Um, so you've got this, was it ever a typical experience that you would begin at a specific location every time you dreamed? Was it always in fantasy land? Was it always next to a roller coaster? Was it always no. walking no, a it was path? Just, it, was just, it was just, I was in some kind of amusement park in the, in the way that a person normally would be and decided, okay, time to go home or I'm ready to go home and couldn't go home. Gotcha. Didn't, you don't remember, was it day or night um, typically or always? I don't think there was any way to perceive it because I was sort of contained. So I, I would say that I sort of had the idea that I didn't even know if it was day or night because I was in something. Gotcha. Park. 
sometimes that's its own type of symbolism. I mean, there is the classical symbolism of, of bright light revealing things or being the, um, the warmth of the sun. There's a lot of different connections humans have with, you know, sunlight makes the plants grow. So it's different, but then nighttime has its own, um, connections with people. Sometimes it's the dark is scary. Sometimes the dark is beautiful. I can see the stars, you know, so it's, it's very much a personal, personal connection with people. But the idea that there is an almost a distinctly noticeable lack of ability to tell whether it is day or night, you are, this, this seems to be enhancing the kind of disconnect and lack of control, um, that, that, not only can you not leave, you don't even have the accurate perception of seeing, is it daytime? Is it nighttime? What time is it? Uh, it's disorienting in that way. Does it, does that kind of resonate with you? Um, yeah, it, it, I would say in, in all of these dreams, there were no windows. I couldn't see the real world. You know, I was out okay. of touch with the real world. I was sort of contained. Like if you've ever been to Space Mountain. Yeah. In Disneyland, so you're inside this thing. There are you know, no windows. No, nope. Right. No looking outside, you know. So it was sort of like that where you're in this this false reality uh, and there, you have no, you're disconnected from reality. And, and of course, your home, which is part of reality. Uh, and, you know, as the dream went on, I became more and more frantic about how do I get the hell out of this place? And I kept looking for doors and being frustrated because I couldn't get out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what usually happens in, in a lot of these is um, I start with where where do you appear? So we're getting we're getting a sense that you're in indoors in in some kind of a content. So you're not if you have images in, uh, from your memory of Disneyland, large swaths of open space, you go you stand in line for <clears throat> what is it? Thunder Mountain Railroad. It's nothing but a little winding path with some rocks and looks like the the South American Southwest. Um, but Space Mountain, very different. You are indoors and actually you lose track of time. And there's lots of little distractions for your eyes and your ears to help you not be so bored waiting in line if possible. Um, sometimes they hide the length of the line by putting you around a corner and you, you're like, oh, it must be the end of the line. So, oh, no, there's another corridor that goes that way. I'm still, there's still another mile worth of line to wait. I, I remember those experiences from way back in the day. Um, but yeah, no windows. So you're, you're very cut off, uh, contained. You're, there's this inability to orient. I keep coming back to the idea of this disorientation. You can't orient yourself by seeing what is beyond this immediate environment. There's something, there's something in there that seems, seems kind of, kind of important. Not sure what, um, yet, but a lot of the descriptions, you know, and the idea of, um, you decide to leave a particular area. So you find a door. Is it just any door? The first door, the only door or one of multiple? You pick the closest one. Does it actually say exit, but it well, doesn't actually I, exit? I don't, I, 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 what I do remember is when I went through the door, I believed it was the exit. And then when I got on the other side of the door, it turned out not to be the exit. It was just another part of the amusement park. And that happened again and again, because each time I went through a door, it just took me to another part of the amusement park. And of course, I got more and more frantic each time it happened. I'm getting, I'm getting a feeling of the, the, the phrase that came into my mind was the, the failure of a problem solving process. Does that, does that idea speak to you in any way? Failure of a problem solving process. You think you found a solution, you go through the door. It's not the solution. It didn't, didn't solve the problem. You're just in another area of the problem. I, I don't know if that makes sense to you. I'm either onto something or I'm not. Well, it, it makes some sense. I think the way I experience this is I'm done with this reality and I want to leave and I can't. So it's mm. like being in prison. Yeah. The, the, only di the only difference with the prison is prison is not supposed to be a fun place. Yeah. So this is like a place where I've been having fun and I'm ready to leave and I can't. Yeah. 
For sure. And and that is a very common human experience as well. This idea of choosing a path, you have a desire. The, the, the whole concept of frustration is you have something you want, you can't get it. The feeling of wanting but not getting is frustration, basically. So we say our goals are frustrated. Uh, we become frustrated by the by the failure to attain it. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> that's, that's why the idea of that uh, problem solving or goal progression type of goal seeking behavior came to mind. Uh, the idea of you take what looks like an opportunity to solve the problem, to make progress on uh, towards your goal. And it's not, you're, you're still stuck in the same problem or process. It, 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 that was not the solution. The more things you try, as I was saying, the common human experience, the more things you try, the, the more the frustration mounts. It's like, repeated frustrations over and over and over again, you get more and more frantic and like, this is not fun. This is not, I'm not enjoying this process. I'm not enjoying this feeling. Um, I, I want out and I feel trapped very, you know, some th th that translates across a lot of, you know, physically you can feel trapped. You can feel trapped emotionally, um, psychologically, uh, you know, feel trapped in a lack of options, um, practically, uh, lots of different ways this this can manifest. I don't know if any of that inspired any thoughts. Um, I remembered something now yeah. as a result of our discussion. An element of this that I had mentioned is that, you know, amusement parks are kind of crazy. You know, like many of the rides are like, it's like uh, allowing you to be crazy or taking part of craziness. And I got tired of being crazy and wanted to be sane again. You know, like the distorted mirrors that they have. And sometimes they have a room that's askew. So yeah. you tend to fall over because the room is not level. Uh, so it's like there's an, an element of insanity in it. So yeah. you're sort of saying, okay, I'll go along with um, getting on Dumbo the Flying Elephant, you know, which is obviously, it's a mechanical recreation of kind of an insane state, you know? Yeah. So, so it's like, all right, uh, I can't, it's sort of like I can't get out of the insane asylum element of it. Yeah, I think that's very, that's a very important, I'm glad you brought it up too, because uh, there's something about roller coasters that are very much, it's like, here's, here's a way to ex safely experience the feeling of being in danger, being out of control, careening wildly, you don't know what's going to happen, you're not in control whatsoever, you're along for the ride, and you really hope the engineers built it right and you're not gonna you know so but but we don't get on the ride going i'm really risking death but when we're on it we have these bodily sensations that give us that thrill of of acceleration and whipping around corners and going upside down loop to loops and all these things that allow us to feel safely feel the threat of an impending disaster and that's kind of that crazy embracing that craziness is how i would um describe it that that you know you go to this place where you can cut loose and let let go of um expectations in a way to have an experience but then there's a moment when you're done when you're like i've had enough thrills and chills and excitement for the day i'm ready to go yeah back to the real world but rather than this faux reality of of simulated danger i want to go back to real st stability safety sanity in in that sense um, yes. I don't know if that, yeah, does that, that re resonates with you? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and anytime you have new thoughts, uh, cut me off and jump in. I, I just ramble until I think of something relevant to say or it inspires the thoughts in the people I'm talking to. Um, and, you know, this, this whole theme, uh, there have been innumerable films and TV shows and books about a sane person who was put into an insane asylum you know, like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is probably the most famous Oh, one, yeah. Uh, where, you know, the guy is not crazy and all these other people are, and he wants to get out, you mm -hmm. know, and can't. And that's, uh, the, the, the difference is that in all of those, the guy, he doesn't usually just walk in voluntarily. 
he's committed by his wife who's trying to get rid of him or something like that. Yeah, it gets picked you know? up by the police after a fight. That's yeah. Right, right. So he's stuck. But in this, we're like, I went in there voluntarily. So I'm sort of uh, moving away from my, my engineering mind, which is very uh, level-headed. You know, I'm known as a very level-headed person. Uh, and going into sort of voluntarily going into this crazy state. You know, I don't use any kind of drugs or alcohol. Yeah. So about as close as I would get to something like that would be like a place like Disneyland. Yeah. Very much so. And that I think that is an important element of the dream, too. The idea that you have at least the recognition that you brought yourself here on purpose. You've put yourself into the situation and there's an element of then of, of what am I trying to say? The idea of self-blame or accepting responsibility for the catastrophe that follows. It may not actually be your fault. What is it? Um, there's a lot of movies that start that way too, or books where people, we're going to go, we're, we're just going diving on the coral reef. And before you know it, the boat's gone and now you got open water and it's just the man and his wife and the sharks and they die. And that's a true story, uh, you know, based on a true story. Anyway, um, they, I, they had to be floating in that water saying we did this to ourselves. We couldn't expect they were going to leave us, but we took a risk and the, all we had to do is not get on the boat. Uh, ah, that's a horrible feeling that kind of a, I'm suffering the consequences of my own actions. Yes. The vagaries of chance intervened and bad things happened, but I didn't have to be here. There's, there's got to be something in there about that voluntary initiation at the very least, and then becoming stuck with the decision, like that you can't get out of it now that you've committed to a, to a path. There's something in there. I don't know if that speaks to you at all, or. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's about regret. What is, what is regret? Mm. Regret is where you do something. And then you regret it because it turns out badly. Yeah. You say, gee, I, sh I wish I had not made that investment. And you really can't blame life. it on anyone else. <laughs> that's right. You can't blame it. On so yeah, there's very much something there. Um, do you remember any particular periods of your life where the dream came to you be related to what you were doing, activities you were engaged in? Um, goals or purposes you were trying to accomplish, relationships you were trying to manage, changing jobs, buying a new house, any any kind of life events where, did you ever notice a pattern of that? This this type of dream recurs when I do X or get into X kind of situation. Yes and no. Let me explain it to you this way. Yeah. I've been meditating my entire adult life, okay? So I've gotten to a very advanced state. And I'm... Uh, entirely in tune with the the spiritual goals of Jainism, Hinduism, uh, Christianity. You know the idea of there's an afterlife, and it's and it's a better place than this. You know, regardless of whatever religion you belong to, it would have to be Buddhism, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so. So that's something that I've been like working towards intentionally for most of my life and still am. And when I do my a meditation, there's a certain amount of frustration in the sense that, ah, oh, there's more stuff here. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. You know, uh, so then you remember this bad relationship you had that you had completely forgotten about and all the bad things that went on. And yeah. now you have to deal with that, you know, and then you work through that and then you find, oh yeah, well, before that there was this other girl, you know? And so, so it's sort of like a lot of frustration. In other words, you're making progress, but you keep finding deeper and deeper things in the subconscious oh, that yeah. present themselves. And so, that to me is very much like this dream where I've been on this path and I actually have some fear uh, that I will not get all the way to where I want to get before I die. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. So, there's, like, there's... for example, go ahead. You know, if you think of like uh, the idea in Hinduism that 
you have your karma and you have to resolve your karma before you can be free. That's the basic idea. And everybody here, whether they realize it or not, are on that road. They, everybody has a karma and everybody is, you know, sort of one way or another sort of trying to work out of it or get out of it. Uh, and I'm cognizant of that, that I keep finding more parts of it, more elements of it. So yeah. every time I find another thing, uh, it's like opening another door and, oh no. I'm still in the park. What have I yeah. found here? This could be and just a very powerful thing. metaphor for life in general. You're trying to get outside the park while you're still alive, but it may be impossible. I don't know. I'm jumping jumping to conclusions there, but um, I don't know if yeah, that... Yeah, like I remember a time many years ago when, uh, as a result of my meditation, I realized that there were girlfriends I had and I can't remember, remember their name. Because mm. I had a lot of girlfriends in my life. And so, like, I remember the face and the relationship, but not the person's name. So this was like a whole person that I had forgotten. And then I remembered, but I still couldn't remember the name. Couldn't, so yeah. <laughs> I, I couldn't get out of that room, you know, until I... So the not knowing the name was like a manifestation of not having resolved this karma. Maybe so. So you're describing so what brought us to this was just asking if you notice these dreams came at certain periods, but rather than relate it to necessarily specific life events, you found another repeating pattern of the idea of trying to clear your mind, clear your karmic debt in the sense of, and it's amazing how you meditate. And as soon as your mind is still, it gets filled with all the shit that was waiting to jump into the emptiness. That's, <laughs> That's right. For sure. Um, I was going somewhere with that, but I like just had that observation, which is, exactly. yes, that is a frustration of meditation. One of the reasons I could never do it. I'm like, I'll just be productive. I'll just keep myself busy with what I do. I edit books all day. I do a little projects here and there. It's, uh, so I'm very much the opposite. Meditation never, I could never get the hang of it. It was always so very unpleasant to try and sit still with the busy thoughts. Uh, no, uh, no moral judgment uh, for or against it. Of course, it's like uh, for me, not so much. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it. But um, but but it is interesting for you. It brought that together. Um, that there's some connection between your experience of the frustration of the meditation process and how it's not just the process. It's something you enjoy, but and something you think is valuable. And something you, you you know you you don't regret having done in your life. It's not something you've given up as pointless, but there is a a re recurrent frustration with it as well that you keep discovering new territory that has to be conquered. In yes. a way, there's something there's something in there. I don't know if you have thoughts in that vein. Um, yeah, because you you have moments of release. You know mm -hmm. when you feel spectacular and spiritual and big and light and they're all those positive things and then the next thing hits you mm. you know so that's pretty analogous to what happens in this tree where i go through a door and i just get more craziness now the whatever place i go into isn't exactly the same as the place i left it's always a little bit different it's a different room but it's still crazy you know, I told a therapist once uh, that I was terrified at the prospect that I may die before I get all the way out. Mm. That in these dreams, that is something that occurs to you sometimes that you might die here without ever finding the exit? No, um, I'm just saying I, I was talking to a therapist. Yeah. You know, and he knew that I was meditating for many, many decades. And, and I said, you know... I'm really terrified that I might not get all the way out. I mean, I've made immense progress. I mean, most people wouldn't even comprehend how much progress I've made after yeah. all these decades. But, Come here. but Come here. I want to completely resolve all of my karma. Oh, yeah. And I have not resolved all of it. There's still, you know, I keep finding little shreds and bits and pieces and, you know, well, yeah. What about that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in some ways, I, it's possible that is the entire reason this dream happens. I mean, it 
lines up pretty well in my head. I, I always hesitate to say we have our answer, rubber stamp it next. But this idea, I mean, it, it really does correlate very well. This idea of, um, and especially if it's going to be this, this type of a real recurrent fear in your life of, of like, you know, I don't want to get to the end of my lived experience on earth and I didn't get the job done. I don't want to have to come back and keep trying again. That's literally the, the life cycle of the reincarnation is you exit one fun house and you get dropped right back into another in a new environment, right. a new body, a new experience, but you're back in the same amusement park. You're not, you haven't managed to escape from, from the cycle, so to speak. Right. Um, I mean, that seems one thing I was going to ask you about is the idea of um, when did this type of dream first start happening? And you said the last time was maybe within the past year that you had it. Yeah, it's it's fairly recent. This series of dreams. This okay. is not something. This is not something from long ago. Not lifelong. This okay. Is, this is something I would say in the last maybe five or seven years that this started okay. to happen. And I think it's because I've made so much progress uh, that, and I keep you know finding more, and I keep. It's like I'm I'm happy with the progress I'm making. Uh, but it's still a little bit frustrating to go through the door and find that you haven't gotten out. Yeah. And that's, that's very typical of dreams to reflect our waking experiences and wishes, desires. I'm not a pure Freudian, you know, that every dream conceals a secret wish and they're mostly sexual. I don't, I don't go there. There's interesting theories, uh, foundational guy, but, but usually it's, it's, we're attempting to understand what we're experiencing and, and sometimes just experiencing the thought of, Oh no, what if I can't get out? And it comes back. And sometimes in this, as in this case, it crystallizes into a particular form. You've got this, the dream's got to take place somewhere. So that somewhere is an amusement park. We, we latch onto a particular way of conceptualizing something. So you've got the theme park and then we have a specific kind of experience there, which is, the desire to leave in your case, the, the say, say I'm done here. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to find the exit, very natural, logical progression. I go to the place where the exit is and I leave done problem solved. And we realize, Oh no, I'm stuck. So you're processing. It sounds to me like this idea that there is an unknown amount of work remaining. You don't know that you're ever going to get out. You don't know. You can't even see the final exit. Um, anywhere and every exit that looks like an exit is a false exit to a new place of being stuck again um so i suppose the most beneficial thing might be to to maybe look at what experiences you might have had and you may not have this answer right now fair enough if you don't it's something you can meditate on in the future so to speak um look at what might have been going on in your life the first time that dream happened and start looking for similarities between that experience that brought up that imagery in the first place and other similar situations that bring it back. Because a lot of times, because you don't have the dream every night, you're going to have it when something reminds you, oh yeah, I'm still stuck in this place with a lot more work to do and it's frustrating. Uh, so when, uh, so it, the, and the good news is, it, it, speaking of, as you say, like as an engineer, if it works, it works. You got to have a practical system. The, the great news about looking at recurring dreams in this form uh, or in this paradigm is that if we've hit on what causes it to happen and what it's saying to you and what it's about, almost 100% of the time, it changes the nature of those dreams going forward. Um, not always, usually, uh, but... Um, then again, there are some types of dreams where you can't change the physical circumstances in your life. So every time the frustration builds, you can have a dream that, that just lets it out, just expresses it, just lets you run through those thoughts in a way that take another look at it. Uh, it's kind of what we're doing is obsessing about these ideas. Like I've got a problem I can't seem to solve. Let me look at it again. Let me look at it again. <laughs> I'm back in the same problem. Let me look at it again. Uh, so, so solving the problem kind of helps you move, move beyond it in, in a way. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. 
Well, first of all, I want to say that uh, I don't think I've had this dream recently. It's, it might have been a year or two mm. since I had it. So there was a period of time when I was having it. Yeah. Not weekly, more like three, six months or something, you know. But enough that I saw that there was a recurring yeah. thing happening. But definitely sporadic. Uh, but yeah. I sort of have the feeling that it's kind of resolved now. It may now, very well home, be. Maybe I'll go to sleep tonight and I'll have the same dream again. Like, <laughs> Having us talk but, about it might actually do that. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I'd be I'd be happy to hear from you, but but there's a good chance not. If you have actually come to some kind of an understanding that changed the way you look at it or allowed you to put it to bed, so to speak, maybe you just hit an acceptance of it. You're like, what am I going to do? It is what it is. And I'm just going to stop worrying about it. Sometimes that's the only thing you can do is say, I'm not going to obsess over this anymore. We're going to see what happens. Um, right. That might have been your yeah, solution, I, but yeah, I, I I think I think it's possible that you know the funny thing about meditation is uh, you hit on something and there's like an erasure, like something just goes away. Mm. You know, like I used to uh, have. I grew up in a time when the United States was a very militaristic place. Mm. Virtually all the men I knew had fought in the war. All my uncles, my brother-in-laws, my cousins, if not one war, a different war, depending on how old they were, you know? Yeah. So that was, and it's like uh, wall-to-wall war, war movies, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I myself was in the ROTC for four years. And, and eventually at some point, I just got out of that. I just said, this is not relevant to me anymore. Mm. And there was like a big change and like chunks of my life just changed. Yeah. Where things, things that I had been doing my whole life that were kind of connected to that, they just stopped. So uh, I think letting that big letting go that I had there might have been why I'm not having that dream anymore. Because sort of holding on to that militaristic ethos. That's sort of like setting yourself up for another traumatic incident. Maybe so, yeah. Because, because you know, if you're in the military, if you don't get killed, you're going to get injured. If you don't get injured, you're going to get court-martialed. If you don't get court-martialed, <laughs> you know, you're going to get KP. It's like not a happy life, really. Yeah, so, very, often actually, very traumatic uh, in terms of like if you experience combat, that's with you forever. That's That makes a yeah. physical change in your brain. It actually does. So the fact that I just said no more to that and completely let go of it uh, and, and, and all of the things that were sort of like connected to it. Mm. Like, for example, I stopped watching sports when that happened. Mm. Completely stopped. There's something very because militaristic sports, about sports competitions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Combat, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, how, what do we do with all these young men who are not going to go out and get killed when they're 13 or 15 like they used to? So yeah. we put them in baseball, football, basketball. Uh, and so, like, I just completely stopped. No, after a lifetime of interest in sports, just completely went away. Mm. So... I think somehow that was sort of like the end of this thing. And, you know, when I contacted you and you told me what you were about, I had to sort of dredge up something, uh, you know, because I haven't had any memorable dreams in some time. I mean, obviously I dream every night like everybody else, but mm -hmm. but uh, then I remembered, oh, yeah, you know, there was this recurring dream yeah. that I was having that was pretty scary and upsetting. Uh, and so I think, I think it sort of got resolved when I had that big thing about the military thing that I just said, yeah, that's it. That sounds no like more. a very reasonable connection. I mean, cause it's, the, it's very much time, time sensitive in terms of if it happened at a particular time and then the dream stops, you were probably on the path to figuring something out about that during the entire and the dreams coming back this is why I tell people don't be afraid of nightmares. Yes, they're unpleasant, but it's like, uh, it's like pain, anxiety, fear. These things are actually evolutionary tools meant to 
say, hey, look over here. This is a problem. This, this is not working. This could kill you. So nightmares are basically the same. It's like there's something going on, something you don't understand that's trying to show itself to you in your mind in, in a particular form. And, you know, people don't have to talk to me. If you can get a, you know, community counselor, talk to your, talk to your uh, uh, brother who reads the psychology magazines for fun or whatever, you know, to talk to someone who's just going to hear you out and do this kind of feedbacky thing. Uh, you know, there may be different levels of skills, but, um, very often, very often, just talking things out with people, it, it allows you to, you give that explanation. Like you were saying, you, you, you said something powerful and I'm like, I love it. That's why I do this. You said, t telling you this story, I just thought of something. I just thought of an element, a detail that very often when we're crafting narratives to explain things to people, it, it's, we can't give everything. We can't, we just can't. We, 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 we lack the thought of the thing that we would have added if we had thought of it, but it's not there because we didn't think of it. But you tell the story, you have someone start looking for feedback and clarification. You're like, that reminds me of another thing. And then that leads to another thing. And that's the, right. that, that's why I love doing this. I do. <laughs> so that's, that's my motivation. That's my passion. That's my uh, purpose uh, in, in all of this. I hope. <laughs> I hope I'm on a, I hope I'm somewhere on your scale uh, towards the, towards the positive end. Well, if you get the book and look at the scales, I'm sure you will be able to find what level you're at on every scale. Very cool. Because you're an insightful person. You know, people who are what I call downscale people who are at or near the bottom of the scales, like Hitler and Pol Pot, mm. uh, you know, Charles Manson, they, the reason they're like that is because they lack insight. People who are insightful can see not to do those things. Yeah. You know, you know, like like a guy might have a bad experience with a Jewish person, right? That could happen, and then he might try to sort of generalize it into some sort of a anti-Semitic old oh, Jews are bad or something. But if he's insightful, he'll say, "Nah, that's stupid." Yeah, it's just one guy. It's very much non-scientific. It's anecdotal, not not uh, you know, and any kind of a uh, provable pattern that is necessarily always obtains. Uh, you know, it's the same. Yeah, well, I mean, racial is one one aspect of it, but other. You know, you have a bad marriage doesn't mean all women are evil. You know, you have a bad therapist, maybe another one you get along with better, and he just, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's uh, um, definitely got a look at the methods you're using to draw conclusions and make right. sure you're not fooling yourself or do doing the best you can with a bad data set. A lot of people do right. that too. They, they get a skewed perspective because they just don't see the whole, the whole puzzle or all the relevant data. That's one of those things that's very important. So, and the more, yeah, and so I think insight, you know, is kind of what makes upscale people, you know, like there are certain, brilliant people who I like to read, I like to study, I like to listen to their, like Jordan Peterson. You know, he's mm -hmm. a brilliant man. He's a brilliant man who's also well-educated. And you can see how insightful he is, you know. And he spent That's a lot of time interrogating Peterson. himself to get to this understanding. Uh, I love, it's the most right. powerful message he's got, I think, is like, if you think you couldn't be a Nazi prison guard, you are at risk of becoming one because you need to know that potential is there so you can prevent it. Otherwise right. you'll end up there on accident because you, you didn't know what was happening to you. That's huge. That's huge. Right. Yeah. Well, on that note and our mutual appreciation of, uh, of the good doctor, um, I have kept you a good long time and we did the dream thing. We talked about your book and we had all these technical difficulties with zoom. I'm not too happy about that, but, uh, I don't know. You feel, uh, is there more you want to talk about with the dream and its connection to your life or uh, you feel like we got a good, no, I, feel, uh, I feel good about it. I oh. feel good about it. All right. I mean, I definitely, it definitely clarified some things for me in my mind, uh, especially why I haven't been having it recently. That's a big deal. When it stops, something changed. Yeah. Some, some yeah. reason that dream was coming back to you over and over didn't exist anymore. You, whether you let it go or the problem was solved or you, you moved on from something that wasn't working for you. There's always a reason there I've found So, And that's what Septemics is about. It helps your insight because 
I have plotted these naturally occurring sequences. I didn't create them. They just presented themselves to me and I wrote them down and I'm giving them to people. And when you look at them, you say, yeah, this makes sense. So it's, you know, it helps the person to be insightful. Very and so cool. you and I are both in the same business. It's just I think you so. Doing, you do it as a psychology major and I do it as an engineering major. <laughs> yeah, and there's a tremendous amount of overlap. And I think a lot of the same approach uh, is, is applied because we're heading in the same direction. So I, th I think that's fantastic. But well, th then let's do that. Let's say this has been our, our uh, friend uh, Jim Marshall from Arizona, author, human development engineer. Uh, you can find his work and his book at septemics.com uh, for the podcast folks that's s-e-p-t-e-m-i-c-s septemics.com and the book is septemics hierarchies of human phenomena i gotta write this time i made i corrected my notes um yeah uh oh and my housekeeping please like share subscribe tell your friends always need more volunteer dreamers uh t-shirt coffee mug direct donations i'm doing a video game stream probably in about half an hour tonight could you hang around and watch that this, this, you won't see that until that, that was stupid. Uh, you won't see that because this won't be out till next week. So I do video game streams and, uh, 13 currently available books of historical dream literature. And I'll just say one more time to our friend, Jim, thank you for being here. I've appreciated the conversation and, uh, very interesting to learn about your book. Thank you, Ben. Good deal. And everybody out there. Hey, thanks for watching. <laughs>